Well, thanks, Lee. Um, yeah, good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, and thanks for coming to my presentation on winter landscape photography. Um, you know, since the pandemic began, I haven't been out shooting nearly as much, and that's probably true of, of most of us here. Uh, but I've started to try to get out more this winter, you know, with the, um, the crowds are lightening up. There's certainly been so many people outside. It's, <clears throat> it's gotten a little easier that way and really got the cabin fever. And so I'm just trying to get those creative juices flowing again, getting back outside. Um, what I have been enjoying during the pandemic, however, is spending more time studying the work of others and uh, listening. I've got a few landscape photography podcasts I listen to on my walks and attending a few virtual workshops even. So I've been trying to fuel my creativity this whole time. And certainly we've all had, had time to go in and, and work on post-processing Im images. So, um, you know, I do love nature photography and hope to share some of that enthusiasm with you tonight. And my main goal is really just to stir your imagination and maybe give you a few ideas for getting out there to shoot some of the winter landscapes that you find to be inspiring. So, you know, it, it's almost easier to be a landscape shooter in the winter. Um, you can sleep later in the morning to catch the sunrise. Uh, the lower angle of light uh, of the sun can create dramatic effects and spectacular backlighting through trees. You know, fog's, fog is a common occurrence certainly here in Metro Atlanta around the Chattahoochee River, but, but all over the state, I imagine, it really adds to the mood. Um, trees become great subjects, and especially if they're covered with snow or ice. You know, we don't get much snow here, but we certainly do get some ice. And, um, uh, you know, the problem is, is that the, the, uh, the cold weather makes it challenging to stay warm and comfortable while we try to operate our camera smoothly to get the shot. So. You know, here are the topics I, I'd like to cover in tonight's presentation. First, a little bit about moods of winter that you can capture in your landscape photography. A little bit about preparation and tips for shooting in the cold or snow. Uh, and then using a telephoto lens for capturing intimate scenes. And then finally, I'd like to talk about um, photo projects, um, a concept I've latched on to lately and, and would like to develop further. And I'll give you an example of a photo project I shot uh, close to home. I thought it might be fun to start by looking at um, how European painters captured the mood of wintry landscapes. Um, some of the earlier landscape paintings of winter were like after the Renaissance in the late 1500s, but it really came into its own during the Romantic period in like the early 1800s. Uh, many of the earliest paintings depicted remote and desolate landscapes that were solemn and still, kind of like the top two on the left here. Um, and most of these painters were from Northern Europe where they were having a really harsh winter back at that time. So they tended to be from, you know, in places like Norway and Germany and, and Russia even. Um, impressionist painters like Monet, which you can see in the top right, experimented with the use of light and color to paint the effects of snow. And note how he used blue-gray colors to depict the shadows in the snow in the top right. So winter scenes are often dominated by cool colors, as is the one in the bottom left. Uh, but then other painters began to combine the warm colors and cool colors, as you can see in the, the bottom middle, and even others uh, captured kind of the overwhelming warmth of a winter sunset. So I guess the idea I want to get across here is that, you know, winter moods depicted in art and in literature and music really are often solitude and loneliness, aging or despair, but they can also signal freshness, renewal and hope. So winter landscapes provide tremendous latitude for expressing a mood or emotion. And, you know, we certainly have a lot of material to work with this winter in expressing moods, you know, from the COVID-19 and we're living life in a bubble to, you know, the elections and the insurrection and the political turmoil. Boy, have we got a, a winter full of emotions, but, you know, there's hope on the horizon too. Uh, I'm starting to feel that a little bit as the vaccine rollout continues. So. 
Uh, there's no excuse for not having some good mood content to deal with uh, this winter. I'll start here with um, showing you a, a calm and solemn winter's morning on the Chattahoochee River uh, at the Island Ford unit. And this is in, in Northern Metro Atlanta. And this features um, a proud goose in the foreground, which has become so emblematic of the river these days. Um, you've got some fog rising above the water and the leaning white trunks of sycamores along the banks. Uh, incidentally, in this, in this shot, I counted at least 16 geese uh, and including a lone great blue heron in the distance on the right. So take a good look at that heron and the geese because this is my wildlife shot for the evening. You might have one other, but it's mostly landscapes tonight. In contrast, this is an image that captures a warmer, hopeful mood uh, on the Chattahoochee River. This is also Island Ford, probably about 10 minutes away from my home. I took this on Christmas morning a few years ago before our, our college age kids would wake up. Now that our, our kids are older and, and they sleep in till you know, late in the morning, I get a great shoot in on <laughs> Christmas morning, plenty of time. Um, this one was taken from a low to the ground vantage point on a tripod and with a wide angle lens, probably a 20 millimeter lens. Uh, nearly all the images you're gonna see were taken on a tripod. This is 60 foot high Cherokee Falls in Cloudland Canyon State Park in Northwest Georgia. I, I went up there this past February, just before the pandemic, because it, it had been pretty wet and I knew there'd be a lot of water in the creek and over the falls. What I like about this image is the, the icicles and the fog and the cool color feels very cold to me. And I remember being very cold out, out in the field taking it. Um, the blue green color of the water just beneath the falls also sort of gives a feel of a, of a sort of paradise. I'm sure many of you who live close to Roswell have photographed the mill dam that's there on Big Creek or AKA Vickery Creek near downtown Roswell. And this is a great place to shoot when temperatures drop below freezing for several days with or without the snow. Um, the ice builds up around the falls. Uh, in this image, there, there is snow on the ground and um, the overall image is cool because much of the face of the dam is in the shadows, but the sun star uh, adds a touch of brightness and warmth, you know, signaling a new day, if you will. Um, I, I remember planning this shot uh, using, you know, the photographer's ephem ephemeris app in order to know what time the, the sun was going to be rising and see what the angle would be uh, while I was standing on this viewing platform next to the falls. Uh, North Georgia waterfalls are also a great subject for winter landscapes. Um, this is Minnehaha Falls near Lake Raven. It's a really short little walk from the parking area up to the falls, um, maybe a tenth of a mile. Um, but because it was cold and damp, there were no other people around, which is another advantage of shooting outdoors in the winter. You don't get as many people. Although that's become a, a bit of a challenge during uh, the pandemic because everybody's gone outside. Um, even So now I take a mask with me um, just for the unexpected encounter that you get close quarters on a trail. And I think you've, if you've hiked, in, hiked on any trails that are uh, put you in close quarters, um, you know, it's a good idea to have the mask. When it's gray or foggy, um, converting to black and white can really help draw interest to your subject. Uh, this is a photo of a tree overhanging the Chattahoochee River at Island Ford. I originally titled this photo Touch because that branch is just seemingly going out and just barely touching the water, but a better title might be Barely Hanging On, which would be <laughs> more symbolic of our, our present times and the feel of being cooped up during COVID. As you might imagine, this tree has since collapsed into the river. Here's a waterfall on Sitton Gulch Creek deep within Cloudland Canyon last February. It was not receiving much light and so I converted it to black and white, which I thought um, focused the attention on 
the interesting flow of the water, at least to me anyway, that's what attracted me to this shot. So it, so it was a good way of, of lessening the distractions of that log and rocks and debris on the other bank. I also cropped it in quite a bit uh, for just that view. Here's another image from Island Ford on a foggy winter morning. Um, I call this one, Two of Us. To me, it feels kind of like a tender and hopeful moment during uncertain times. I like the mysterious mood created by the fog with the sun trying to burn through and the tree, which appears to have some mistletoe, which also seems symbolic of the, of the two um, geese or ducks. I'm not, <laughs> can't recall which ones they were, probably geese based on number, but I decided to leave this one in color because of the, the subtle but pleasing tones around the sun and, and the reflection in the foreground. I call this image uh, Wonderland because of the light snow that had fallen, creating a magical feel. And it's also in the Smokies, not too far away from the site of the historic Wonderland Hotel at Elkmont. Uh, this image is on the middle prong little river in the Tremont section of the park. Uh, I used a neutral density filter. It was early and I, I probably didn't actually need the neutral density filter, but I wanted to exaggerate the silky white water which harmonizes well with the, the light outlines of the snow on the branches. Um, I know some don't prefer silky water, but, um, or too silky of water. I, I really like the way it works with this particular image because of how white it makes the water and, and matches the snow. Um, this is a favorite spot I visit every fall during the GMPA Smokies trip. So um, I could probably create a little project from my shots at this site, but I will talk about projects later. So that's kind of, um, I could pause here if there are any questions. And I'm not, um, in this view, I'm not really seeing the so chat. Far. Really none so far. Okay, that sounds good. All right. Um, well, if you think of any, we've got plenty of other points. Um, so we'll continue on. Uh, so how might you best prepare to stay warm and also manage to manage your gear when you're going out for a winter shoot. Um, well, here's some good rules of thumb. Uh, you want to dress in layers, um, so your 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 smart wool and <laughs> your cashmere sweaters and your jackets and scarves and hats, waterproof boots or shoes, and warm gloves or or even the fingerless mittens. I've been trying to experiment uh, with some of those. I'm not real happy with my hand solutions, but um, that, that to me is one of the main uh, constraints. So I take disposable hand warmers and find that helps a lot. And um, so if I do need to take my gloves off, I can have those in my pocket to keep my hands warm. Uh, start with fully charged batteries. Um, those batteries will run down faster in cold weather. And I've never had to do this, but the prevailing wisdom if you're in a really cold place like you know, Yellowstone or Glacier or someplace farther north, right now, New York State, right? Uh, tuck spares close to your body, the batteries, just to keep them warmer and the, so that they hold their charge longer. I mean, if it's snowing or if it's rainy or wet, um, you want to pack some extra microfiber cloths to wipe off your lenses and your gear. Um, you might find it helpful to use tripod leg protectors. Those, have, those wrap around the legs and help insulate your hands if you've got to carry your tripod around on a trail or uh, handle it for, for pro prolonged periods. And then because your camera's getting cold outside, uh, before you bring it indoors, um, there's, there are recommendations that you, you want to either put it in the inside of your bag or inside of a Ziploc bag before heading indoors so you don't get condensation forming. Uh, on your outside or even the inside surfaces of your camera. So those are just a few tips about preparing for shooting in the cold weather. Um, I also reviewed some of the prevailing guidance out there online uh, for tips for shooting snow. And so I came up with this basic list of tips. 
And uh, using a zoom lens is a good idea. Uh, that's so that you don't have to change your lenses. You're not really, you're not gonna be sure of what you might encounter when you go out in the winter, especially the snow. And so um, you'll have more flexibility if you have a zoom lens on. Um, if it's sunny, you'll wanna use a lens hood to avoid lens flare. Lens flare. Uh, and then using a polarizing filter to reduce glare and darken a blue sky is a good idea. Start with auto white balance, or that's what I would do, and experiment with cooler tones if you'd like. Um, but auto white balance is a good starting point, and especially if you shoot in RAW, you can always adjust that during post-processing. Uh, it may be necessary to increase your exposure if the snow predominates in the scene because your camera is gonna meter towards a, a medium gray. So for the snow to show up white, you wanna add exposure. So you, so you might start out adding one or two, two stops exposure to see what you get. And then just rely on your histogram and adjust your exposure compensation until you get a, a good exposure. Uh, if you wanted to capture falling snow, um, a good starting point uh, to freeze the action of snow in the, in the sky would be a shutter speed of about uh, 1 250th of a second. And that would kind of freeze its action. So it's not blurs, but that you'll actually see, see the snow itself. Oh, and, and watch where you step if you're setting up a landscape shot on fresh snow. You want to stay out of the scenes that you want to shoot. You know, foot, footprints may detract from the mood you're trying to create. So especially if it's one of solita solitude, isolation, or simplicity, you want to minimize that human uh, interruption or disturbance in the scene. So back to the Roswell Mill Dam. Um, this is during a sustained below freezing period. And really, what, there really hadn't been any snow, but it kind of looks like snow. Um, that's all ice buildup from a couple of days of freezing temperatures. And I like the contrast in this shot uh, between the cool shades of the shadows and the warmth of the sun that's striking the falls. Here, uh, the color contrast of the surrounding shrubs and background trees create depth and harmony uh, between the bluish and the reddish tones. Uh, this is Diamond Fork in the Wasatch Range, southeast of Salt Lake City and it's in the, the Yunta National Forest. If you've ever driven from Salt Lake City to Moab, uh, which I did two winters ago to take a workshop. I took a workshop with Richard Burnaby um, at uh, Canyonlands and Arches National Parks in Moab. But on the way back to the airport, it was snowing uh, crazy over the Wasatch Range as I was approaching Salt Lake City. And I pulled off on this road into the, the National Forest and um, I wish I'd had more time. I certainly wasn't prepared. I was, you know, in my street shoes and ready to go to the airport in like, you know, eight inch deep snow, trying to get as close to that stream as I could. <laughs> but it, it was fun. Um, you know, in a normal year, a workshop's a great way to experience a true winter landscape. You know, we don't get it in Georgia, you know, certainly with the snow very often, unless you visit North Georgia a lot, which many of you may do. Um, but a workshop's a great way. Uh, to visit our, you know, more northern or western national parks. This image shows how well snow can accentuate details in the landscape. Uh, this was taken from the Green, Ro Green River Overlook in Canyonlands National Park uh, in Utah. Uh, a heavier snow can often simplify the landscape by eliminating the details, but here the snow highlights the details in the landscape. Here again, um, light snow highlights the background and provides contrast with the red rocks of Dead Horse Point State Park on the Colorado River near Moab. Uh, my hands were very cold this morning. I wished I'd had warmer gloves or a, a better system uh, for, for keeping them warm. This incidentally is the the location from Thelma and Louise movie where they drove off the cliff. I think it was a little further over to the left, but this is one of those iconic landscapes that um, are fun to capture, but everybody shoots when, when you're out near, near Moab. 
Here's another image of a grand landscape and an icon, delicate arch in Arches National Park. You know, this is the arch that you see on the Utah license plate. Um, it's improved here, I think, by some light snow cover and snow cover in the background and certainly on the mountain range. It's a nice combination of warm tones in the foreground and cool tones in the middle and some warm tones farther in the background. Um, there was no way to take a bad picture at this spot on that evening. And as the 100 other photogra photographers would attest to, <laughs> some would argue that's the reason not to shoot um, these grand landscapes because everyone's doing it. You get the same scene and, you know, more intimate scenes can be more fulfilling. And, and I kind of agree with that. But, you know, this was a beautiful place and I'm glad I got to experience it and photograph it. Uh, just. Um, beautiful time of year to be there. So here, because snow was not dominating the image, I, did, I didn't have to dial in any exposure compensation when I was in the field to keep the snow white. I mean, I just shot it with the matrix metering and I, must, I probably adjusted in post-processing, but there was nothing unusual or overwhelming about the snow cover for the exposure. Converting to black and white uh, simplified this image from Canyonlands National Park, creating a cold, austere feeling with that tree juxtaposed against the rock. Um, here's one that you wouldn't see from Arches National Park very often. So, so this one is a little more intimate, although it has sky in it. But I was drawn to this scene by the presence of water in in courthouse wash, which is what they call streams out there, washes, because they're usually dry. And I guess when they do flow, it's it's kind of a wash of a uh, spate of water that flows through quickly. I was attracted here by these reeds that were laying down in the water. And this is actually taken with a pretty wide angle lens, probably around 14 millimeters. Um, but the reeds to me are emblematic of, of the senescence and dormancy of vegetation during the winter. And I converted it to black and white because otherwise it was dominated by red. Um, the red butte in the background and the water itself was just red as can be. So I was most interested in the dark pattern of the reeds and the trees framing the butte uh, in the background. So um, I'll pause here again, Lee, to see if there might be any questions. Um, yeah, we have one question. Do you add much saturation in posts? Uh, and she was referring to the arches shot. Um, yeah, the delicate arch shot. Um, I didn't add any saturation for the foreground. Um, so that does get that bright, that foreground, but probably in the background a little bit. Um, I would have adjusted contrast, and sometimes that has the side effect of increasing saturation. But I didn't really add in a lot of color. It just probably came about through um, contrast. Um, yeah, so it, it was a very colorful scene, for sure. And then there's always the obvious question that always comes up in these webinars, what type of equipment do you use? Um, I would say that um, most of these shots were taken with, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i currently using a, a Nikon D800E for most of these shots, full frame camera. And then before that I had a, a D7100. So some of them might've been shot with that, which is a crop sensor camera. And then maybe a, a shot or two with the D90 before that. but the D800E probably for most of these. What lenses do you like to use? You, you, I mean, you brought up the whole thing about taking, you know, using zoom lenses to uh, minimize the amount of lens swapping you'd have to do. Yeah, um, I, I, um, I like the 24 to 70 a lot. Um, I think I, I end up with that lens an awful lot. I do like the 14 to 24. I kind of got, I was in a wide angle mood for quite a while and I used that a lot, uh, but now I'm trying to come in and be, get a little more intimate on landscapes. Not that any of these were that intimate, 
but I would say the 24 to 70 and the 70 to 200. I don't have anything longer than 200 without renting. And sometimes I rent lenses from um, lensrentals.com. Like I'll, I've tried the 150 to 600 before, um, but none of these shots were taken with that. Okay. okay, I think we can go on. Thanks. Okay, so lately uh, I have been using my 70 to 200 a bit more uh, and actually a lot more for my landscape photography. I, it's practically all I used in the Smokies this last fall um, with a few exceptions, but I, I spent a lot of time with it. Um, but oddly enough, I'm gonna start out with a shot that's not <laughs> an intimate scene um, but I want to use it to illustrate something. You know, this uh, is it not an intimate scene because the sky is so prominent in it. And as you might imagine, um, this was during that trip out to Moab. And in the middle of the day, we were kind of on our own. And so I would go out exploring along the Colorado River. And um, this is a tree that's right along the bank of the Colorado River. And that bluff is on the opposite side of the river. And I, I was kind of struck by the, the color and the graphic nature of the image. And I liked that the tree nearly conformed to the contour of the bluff itself. So that was a midday image. And, you know, I was happy to capture that. Um, I like it pretty well. But when I got into post-processing it in Lightroom, I started to become more interested in this inner part of the tree here in this kind of circular pattern. I don't know if you can see my cursor there or not. It creates almost a circular pattern. And I thought, well, I probably have enough pixels from my D800E to crop. So I cropped it and focused in more on, you know, on my area of interest. And this became an intimate landscape, which I also like, and, but even better than the other image. And so you know, by eliminating the, the context of the bluff in the sky, it creates a more abstract composition and feel. Uh, the branches are more prominent against the red rock. So, um, you know, actually that still has enough resolution that it works pretty well as a smaller print. Um, so anyway, I was resolved to begin using my telephoto lens more after this and to compose and capture intimate scenes in camera. And certainly also I've been inspired by that, um, by Charlotte Gibbs presentation in 2018 down in Columbus um, on intimate landscapes. So she's been a strong influence on me wanting to try uh, those approaches. I call um, this intimate landscape overwhelmed. This is on the Chattahoochee River. Uh, I took this last weekend after some rainfall and some higher releases from Buford Dam. Um, so these trees were flooded out along the, along the bank. I used the 70 to 200 to take this. And um, there are five tree trunks here. I played around with the numbers of tree trunks. Um, I felt like this number worked the best. Um, it's often said that like if you use an odd number, that's better than an even number. But I think you just have to experiment with that and see what you like and try, try different arrangements. And I converted that to black and white in Lightroom. I'm going to cheat here a little bit. This was fall in the Smokies, uh, but it was cold and it was snowing lightly. And, and with, you know, it shows that the snow accents the leaves um, so well um, with contrast and texture. And, and, you know, it just shows how finding a colorful subject can really bring, bring out a much more bolder and uplifting feel to a winter image. That was during one of our Smokies trips. I call this one Ice Veil. Um, this one also taken with a 70 to 200. What's behind the veil is a 90 foot high waterfalls, uh, Hemlock Falls in Cloudland Canyon State Park. Uh, the mist from the waterfall had frozen all over the trees and these little branches. And there was a viewing platform right next to this on the right, but I couldn't get up on top of it because it was just covered with ice. And it would have given me a clearer view of the falls, but I mean, I, I literally wouldn't, couldn't walk on it. I watched other people slip around and try to do it. It was nearly impossible. So I just set up my tripod where I was <clears throat> and shot through these branches. And I kind of thought that was a neat effect of the 
ice covered branches, which I otherwise would have ignored and wanted to move out of the way. This was an early morning flight into Reykjavik and a view of a frozen lagoon. Oh, sorry, uh, wrong image. Now this is, um, uh, this is a decomposing stump protruding from a beaver pond at the Cochrane Shoals unit of the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area. Um, you know, I like how eliminating the sky and the vegetation around it just creates sort of ambiguity about the scale and makes you wonder about the shot more. Uh, the ice and the blue tones here, to me, kind of conjure some solitude and loneliness, but there's a, a hint of hope with the warm light that's kind of coming in um, uh, from the right on these, on this, this decomposing wood. <laughs> I consider this an intimate landscape, but it wasn't taken with the telephoto lens. I, this was with the 24 to 70, probably around 40 millimeters, something like that. This is the same shoal that I showed you in the Wonderland image, but in a different year. This was this past November. Um, I like how the foreground roots and the rock create depth, much like a traditional landscape, but I did eliminate the sky and the trees surrounding the river. Um, but that's not as intimate as you might get. I mean, you can look at the scene and pick out other intimate shots, which is what I did on the next one. I put my 70 to 200 on and I composed a scene from this area up here in the riffle that I'm circling with my cursor and came up with this. And I call this image, um, if, if I had to name it, <laughs> I'm gonna call it Boundless Dreams because to me it kind of creates a dreamy mood um, the only context remaining is that rocky edge on the right side. And if there had been a way to eliminate that, I might have tried, but I really like the, the dark area that spans across the bottom of the image and I wanted to retain all of it. So um, I kept the rocks. This was a cold and cloudy day in the Elkmont section of the Smokies. Uh, I was high up on a trail above Little River. Um, and I took this image with my 70 to 200 on a tripod. It's even snowing a bit, and it was probably flurries, but you can see some light streaking across the image. But I, I wasn't trying to freeze the snow or wasn't thinking about that. So my shutter speed wasn't fast enough to do that. I was more focused on the water and the, the rocks in the bottom of the stream, kind of creating an abstract image. I call this image Ripple Forest. I took this shortly after sunrise two weekends ago. Again, over at Island Ford, there's a pond there. And as I was leaving, I was driving by, I don't usually stop there, but I was struck by the reflections in the far back corner of the pond. So there's a really good place to set up there um, with a tripod um, out near the road, quite easy to get to. And I set up the tripod and used the cable release and had a fun leisurely time just composing images with the reflections. You know, I, I intentionally excluded the land in this particular shot and focused on the water surface itself, which helped create those ripple effects, almost like an impressionist painting. Uh, and then in post-processing, I flipped it 180 degrees so the trees appear to be right side up. So that gives it a little, um, impressionistic feel, I think. I took this image last week, last weekend along the Chattahoochee River. Um, I call it fractured. Um, sure, it's, it's, a, it's a rock wall, it's some bedrock along the river, but to me, I was thinking about it as a metaphor for kind of the dark, fractious times that we're currently in, or at least that's the way I'm feeling. I post-processed it processed it <clears throat> to emphasize the feeling of, you know, highlighting the cracks and darkening the, around the outside, the vignette to give it more of a dark, solemn feel and in black and white. And I, I do like this um, quote from the photographer Minor White, um, who said, one should not only photograph things for what they are, but for what else they are. So it is a rock, but I wanted to <laughs> capture some emotion with the way it was post-processed, something that I was feeling. 
one could imagine that this is a blazing red maple forest surrounded by a vast rocky landscape in a faraway land. Uh, actually, it's in a, on Arabia Mountain uh, in the eastern metro area over near Lithonia. Uh, this is a small patch of a native plant that lives in these shallow depressions on these granite outcrops. This was taken last winter in March. Um, I'm still going to claim that's winter through the middle of March. And uh, this plant is diamorpha. And many of you who've been there have seen this. It, it's very prominent um, on Arabia Mountain and Panola Mountain on the granite outcrops. But the, the lack of context by eliminating sky and other features kind of creates mystery about the scale. This was taken with a, a, a 105 millimeter macro lens and uh, on a tripod and I did focus stacking. I think I took about 10 images uh, through that and then I focus stacked them so that it would appear in focus from the front to the back. And it's in a pretty small, pretty small area. And for those of you in the coastal chapter, I'm sorry I don't have many <laughs> coastal shots in this presentation because it just doesn't feel as much like winter. Um, I could, uh, I do have a lot of shots from Florida in particular, but uh, this is a, a full moon in February, which is referred to as the snow moon. And it was rising um, above the ocean as just as the sun was setting, uh, which created these wonderful pink pink hues on the water. Um, this was taken with a telephoto lens on a tripod, probably um, at about 80 millimeters. And it would have been a pretty image um, on its own, but what really makes it to me is, the, is the, uh, this auspicious audience that showed up for the sunset or the sun, the moonrise that evening. These laughing gulls in the foreground, I think make the shot um, just by adding depth and interest to the overall scene. And that's taken with the telephoto. It's not actually an intimate landscape in the sense that it, that it, that it has sky in it, but it feels kind of intimate to me. Okay, so I'll pause here again. And before I go into the last section to see if there are any other questions. Oh, yes, we had a few come in. Um, so what influences you to convert to black and white? Uh, does uh, a lot of snow suggest shooting in black and white? I guess, what's your motivation? <clears throat> yeah, my motivation in part is, is how much color uh, is in the image that is interesting to me. If there's not much color and I'm really just focused on the form or the shape of the image or the composition, then I'll try black and white. And to be honest, I, I haven't done that much black and white. I've been trying it more lately. So um, it's a kind of fun to experiment with it. And winter landscapes uh, seem like a good subject for that. Um, yeah. When you're hiking out, when you're hiking out to a waterfall, um, what tips do you have in keeping your camera backpack uh, to a reasonable weight? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, it can get pretty heavy. I, I try to decide what lenses I think that I'll need and um, you know make a reasonable bet that I don't need one lens or another and, and try to take maybe two or a maximum of three lenses. Um, and I've found that um, I used to carry the 14 to 24 millimeter lens around a lot, it's a Nikon, but it doesn't take filters or not very easily. So you can't really use, or I can't use a polarizing filter on it. So I've been taking a 20 millimeter prime lens instead that I can put a filter on for polarizing and that's way lighter. So I might take it in the 24 to 70, for example, to go out to shoot a waterfall. But nowadays I probably would add the 70 to 200 because it's, it's really becoming a lens I'm trying to use more often and, and, and enjoying what I'm seeing from it. Um, about aperture, is there a usual starting point that you have, or do you just have to assess um, your aperture when when you know what you're taking a picture of? Um, 
Yeah, for uh, the landscapes, I, mean, I do shoot an aperture priority and depending on how uh, how deep the, the field of view is that I wanna capture and focus. I mean, I'll probably start at F8 and shoot F8, 11 and 16 and uh, in between. I would rarely shoot at F22, but if I felt like <clears throat> I needed it to get the shot. Um, I would give up some of the ISO um, to get it um, and graininess or whatever. But um, I probably had them at 11, F11 and F16 a lot for the shots that you've seen. Are you using autofocus mostly or do you zoom in and focus manually for shots and if you're doing any macro work, like with your 105, have you ever done any focus stacking? Um, I usually focus manually because I'm on a tripod. I focus manually most of the time. Um, and I use the, the live view on the camera um, so that you can focus more precisely. I mean, you don't always need that, of course, and you could autofocus a lot. I could probably autofocus a lot more than I do, but I kind of into just sort of being a little slower and manually focusing and recomposing and getting it the way I want um, <clears throat> and deciding where I need to focus in the image to, to get the everything in, in focus that, uh, that needs to be. Um, I have tried some focus stacking. I haven't done it a lot. That one image of the, the red diamorpha um, is one of the, probably one of the few examples that I've used it where I've you know, was pleased with what I got. Oftentimes it's been more of just an experiment and I wasn't as intent on the composition as I was the technique. And, but I think I'm getting more comfortable with the technique and using it and trying it more often. Okay, do you use your phone much? Um, yeah, I, I take my phone with me everywhere um, and use it a lot. If to get ideas, especially if I don't have my other camera with me, if I'm out walking or hiking somewhere, um, I'll, I find it a constant source of uh, creativity and inspiration to take it out and, and shoot with it. I think a lot of people also use it before they get their main camera out, you know, when they first arrive at a site and want to do a little recon and see what would look good. I think that's another good way to use it. And somebody was recommending ice grips for uh, footwear, especially in winter conditions. Yes, um, I would. I would agree. I, I maybe, maybe not so much right around here, but in North Georgia, if it's icy and snowy, it's certainly out in the Rocky Mountains. Even in the summer out there, you you might need ice grips if you're hiking up to one of those high elevation lakes. It's a good suggestion. Okay, we can move on. <clears throat> okay. Well, so now I'd like to tell you about an approach to developing photo projects that I've found to be super intriguing. And I, this is something I came across and have studied a, a bit during the pandemic, um, being indoors and all. And I'm gonna refer to them as six image projects, a la Brooke Jen, Brooks Jensen and, and Brooks Jensen is a, a fine art photographer and, and a publisher of a magazine called Lenswork. And you can find him on lenswork.com or his own photography at that website for brooksjensenarts.com. Um, but this past August, I participated in an online workshop with Brooks and a nature photographer named Jack Curran as part of the Out of Chicago In-Depth Conference. And uh, the the workshop is called Beyond the Single Image, From Finding to Refining the Project. So I'm gonna share with you some of the things, some of the highlights from that. I mean, it was truly inspiring to me. So I wanna share kind of the overall approach uh, to get your creative juices flowing and, and show you my first attempt at a six image project. So the idea of, of a six image project, and, you know, a project can be anything you want it to be, as many images as you want, but he sort of recommends six images as a nice, a nice place to, to experiment. Um, you want six images that tie together with a theme and stylistically similar and, and, you know, 
help to tell maybe a, what you would consider a, a short story in images. And, and his feeling is that if you limit yourself, putting limits on the number of images actually uh, uh, sparks your creativity on living within that set of limitations or guide rails. And you could develop projects from images you've already taken. In fact, he would advocate, you know, sorting through your catalog of images and dividing them up by themes or different types to, to see what stands out to you as a, as a concept that you might develop as a photo project. So you, the idea would be that each image that you use uh, adds to the understanding of your, your concept or your subject or whatever you're trying to convey without saying the same thing twice. So you don't wanna have the same exact image um, in there, uh, too much repetition, but different points of view <clears throat> that give a fuller picture and understanding. And part of doing it all requires editing your work and deciding what you're gonna include and what you're gonna exclude from a six image project. So it, feel, it fuels a creative process, if you will. And he even likes to combine um, the images with short text to tell a story. Um, so, um, you know, you could have a, a, par a short paragraph or two, or maybe even a, a, a poem, a haiku or something like that, that goes with your images. Uh, and together they, they complement one another to tell the story. And the kinds of projects that you might think of, um, it could be a common subject you might like trees of a certain kind or streams or or buildings or cities or whatever. And um, you you um, view that as a project and take them in a stylistically similar um, manner so that there's continuity and unity to what you to your project. Uh, it might be a portrait of a place or a way of life. Um, these aren't all landscapes. It could be, human stories of interest. It could be a story in time or uh, what else it is, you know, a metaphor or um, something made, made to be photographed like, you know, a rolled up paper. I've seen artists who, who take photographs of rolled up paper under different lighting. So there's all kinds of, uh, uh, no limit to really the kinds of ideas uh, that you could put into a project. But, um, so I put together this six image project um, from the Chattahoochee River near my house. I can get down to this spot on the river uh, in about four minutes. So uh, it's a place I go often in the winter to capture um, the dawn and sunrise. And um, I've been going there for probably the last seven or eight years, a few days each winter. And um, it's on the Chattahoochee. And as you probably know, the Chattahoochee River, it's, drinking water supply for the city of Atlanta and the greater metro area. It's also a national recreation area, <clears throat> supports a popular urban trout fishery. So, you know, maintaining the quality of the river is important to our life around it. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna show you um, a project and um, it's, it's probably mainly about the river and maintaining its ecological integrity. That's the way I thought about it originally, but kind of what's been happening lately and uh, with the Capitol riot and all of that, I can kind of see this as a metaphor too for the importance of our, our institutions for maintaining stability, norms, the health of our society. society. So maybe, maybe you'll see if that matches it or not, but I'm going to, um, I, I've accompanied this with a haiku. So uh, bear with me. <laughs> Uh, so in think about this as if you look at the images in in dawn's glow revealed trees protect from outside threat river life sustained so this is the first image i took of this spot that really captured my imagination several years ago back around 2015 i felt you know almost like it's almost like a spiritual connection with the river uh, this is kind of the ideal, you know, the trees are protecting the river and its quality from outside threats of the watershed upstream or human disturbance. On another morning, it has a more pastel hue, um, feels more calm and serene. Another morning with the 
warmer of color of light, some purple hues in the background. These are all taken probably around oh, 35 to 50 millimeter um, focal length. I added some images this, this winter and actually this incidentally happened to be January 6th, which was the day of the Capitol insurrection. It's calm, it's serene. And I went out the next morning on January 6th. Uh, this was after the insurrection. I felt that that was kind of symbolic about um, the stress on our environment. Um, and in the last image, as the sun is risen, threats are averted, stability and resilience maintained. So um, that's a project. It's a different way to think about your images and how to approach your work, not just about a single image. They don't need to individually be killer images if they work together as a group. Um, so if you like this kind of concept, I would encourage you to go look at uh, Brooks Jensen's uh, work. Uh, he publishes some books of six image projects on, it's on his lens work website and they're called Scene and Sixes. I just ordered one of the books. There's 50 six image projects in it. It hasn't arrived yet, but I'm looking for it for lots of additional ins inspiration and ideas on, on six image photo projects. Um, and in, in his books, each, each page, uh, each project consists of three sets of facing pages. Um, so anyway, you might wanna check that out. I think it's pretty neat. Um, part of the challenge of creating a six image project is, as I said, you have to edit it and maintain its integrity as a unifying concept. And here I was shooting the sunrise at that same spot. And then this, this rower shows up suddenly and just ruined my landscape, Sean. Uh, so I couldn't include this one in the project. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm set up for this shot and I see this guy coming and he was moving really fast and I had to scramble and I panicked, you know, landscape shooters not usually ready for that, that quick, um, quick bit of action. And so I pulled, um, picked up my camera. It was set for F-22 in this case to get the Sunstar. And all I needed, all I had time to do was just dial up the ISO, which I did so that my shutter speed would be fast enough. So this one was taken at F-22, ISO 4000, and a 1 500 second shutter speed, which, you know, it creates some graininess and stuff, but um, I nearly panicked, but I lucked out really, and I captured, you know, both the frozen action of the rower, and, um, and, and I think he's perfectly situated there, and then the sun star effect too. So I was really lucky, a lucky landscape phot photographer. Okay, so I guess to sort of wrap up here, <clears throat> you know, there are many opportunities in Georgia and the metro area to capture beautiful winter landscape scenes. Um, it's great if you can go farther north and up to North Georgia. Um, I, I haven't had that many extremely snowy sheen, scenes to share with you, but hopefully you'll, you'll find some inspiration in these. Um, you can often find ice, fog, and definitely beautiful light. <clears throat> this is another shot from Arabia Mountain in March. And you can see the vernal pools, uh, one of the vernal pools that they support unique plant life, uh, which you can see on the surface of, of this pond. And uh, really with just a little preparation and planning, some warm layers and a pair of hot hands, you know, winter's a great season to get out there to explore and come home with some inspiring images. And I hope you all have been doing that in your own neighborhoods and and whatever travels you can manage to do safely uh, during this pandemic. And I'll conclude then by offering a few <clears throat> recommended photographers, books, and podcasts that you might have fun checking out. Um, photographers, um, I mentioned Charlotte Gibb, and many of you are familiar with her from, from her GNPA presentation at Expo in 2018. Um, she also like the judge for the Ansel Adams competition. That's right. And um, Michael Fry is someone that she shoots with a lot and he has a really good uh, Lightroom um, PDF book um, that you can purchase. It's not very expensive, but I've learned a lot from him on, on using Lightroom. And then Alex Noriega is another really excellent 
landscape photographer who shoots intimate scenes. So you should check out his work. Um, I've listed a few books there that I've, I, I like and have looked at for inspiration. I wanted to point you to the lenswork.com. Um, Lenswork Magazine, um, I subscribed to that this year during the pandemic and I'm enjoying getting that. <clears throat> it's all about the photographs. There's nothing about photo equipment and ads about photo equipment and that kind of thing. It's landscape photography. And he'll, that magazine will feature three to five different photographers in each issue. This latest issue um, has a really neat um, set of images from Peter Essek, uh, who's from Atlanta. And he's, many of you have seen his presentations, um, but he's got drone photography of construction sites in Metro Atlanta. And they're just um, abstract aerial views from the drone of these construction sites. It's, it's really cool. That's the kind of stuff you'll get out of lens work. It's more about creativity. Um, and then there's books and monographs there. I mentioned Scene and Sixes, um, 50 six image projects. And I'm looking forward to that. And then if you're out walking around the neighborhoods a lot during the pandemic and you wanna listen to some podcasts, Brooks Jensen also has a podcast called Lens Work. And they're very short. Most of them are short, just a few minutes, several of them. Every now and then they're about 10 minutes long. And then um, this guy, Matt Payne, who lives in Colorado has been doing these interviews on a podcast called F-Stop, Collaborate and Listen. And I would suggest checking out his first 100 episodes from maybe 2018, 2019. He interviews a lot of landscape photographers, including Charlotte Gibb, Michael Fry, Alex Noriega, William Neal. He interviews Brooks Jensen and probably a bunch of other people that you've heard of and, and may, may find inspiring. So with that, um, I'll see if there are any other questions, but thank you. Thank you so much for attending tonight. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of my images with you.